This is Father Jonas Revoir. He was a serial sexual predator in Nunavut during the 1960s. He is on the run, hiding from justice in France. Attorney General David Lametti and the Liberal government are doing nothing to bring him to justice. This man raped children in the Sir Joseph's, Joseph Bernier Federal Day School in Chesterfield Inlet, Nunavut. Revoir then moved around communities such as Akvet, Nauyat, Rankin Inlet, and my home Baker Lake. The abuse at his hands has caused generations of trauma. The government of Nunavut demanded that Lamedi bring him to justice, but Lamedi has refused. Instead of facing justice for his crimes, Revoir is living a luxurious retirement in a home for priests in Strasbourg, France, and the federal institution is doing nothing about it. Today I'm here with my colleague Charlie Angus to say enough is enough. Indigenous people need truth and justice. Not only about individual abusers like Revoir, but about the hell hole of all genocidal residential school systems that the churches and the federal institution used in their attempts to destroy us and take our lands. We need full and independent investigation that has the power to shine a light on every faucet of this national crime and that has power to bring perpetrators to justice. The map of Canada is covered with crime scenes. The unmarked graves that, shock, that have shocked Canadians are just the tip of the iceberg. We have been saying this for generations and it's time for Canada to face the truth. Together with Charlie Angus, I am calling on Attorney General David Lametti to appoint an independent special prosecutor immediately that has the power and resources to conduct a thorough and comprehensive investigation into residential schools day schools, sanatoriums, and everywhere Indigenous children and peoples have faced decades of violence and abuse at the hands of the genocidal partnership between the federal institution and the churches. We cannot trust the Justice Department to do this without an independent special prosecutor and international observers. Not only has the Justice Pro Department protected perpetrators like Revoir in the past and kept criminal documents sealed to the public, but they have contributed to the ongoing crimes of genocide. How can a perpetrator of mass crimes investigate themselves? What would we say if this was happening in another country? or in a non-Indigenous community. Many genocides around the world have been investigated, and the perpetrators were tried for their crimes. It's time we treat this as a crime of genocide that continues to happen here in Canada today. Almost everyone I know has been affected by the trauma from the violence of the residential school system and the perpetrators who used it to abuse children in some way. Cycles of violence that started when children were stolen from their families continue to this day. Not only do we need truth and justice, but we also need healing. And don't tell me that a phone number is enough. There cannot be reconciliation without truth. 
There cannot be reconciliation without justice. So today we're calling for truth and justice. The federal government and the church are responsible for the fact that people like Revoir destroyed childhoods and continue to destroy childhoods today. What begun with institutions that were designed to annihilate us continues to haunt our communities today. We need a special prosecutor and an independent investigation into crimes against humanity and genocide. Minister Lametti, don't you dare tell me you can't do this. You have the authority. You don't, you just refuse to use it. And that needs to end today. Matna. Good morning, Wache, Charlie Angus, Nishna Kaz. I'm very honored to be with my colleague Mumalak. Because the discovery of the 1,323 graves at former Catholic residential school sites have shaken this nation to the core, and people are demanding answers and they are demanding justice. But in order to get federal government to justice from the federal government, they must end their long standing collusion with the Catholic Church. Canadians learned so much from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But what we learned from the implementation of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement is that the Catholic Church and the federal government were focused on one shared objective, limiting their liability. And so today, we, on behalf of the New Democratic Party, are calling for this cover-up to end. This man is Father Arthur Lavoie, an oblate priest from St. Anne's Residential School. When the St. Anne's hearings began in 2008, the Justice Department of Canada supplied false documents to the hearings claiming there was no evidence of any crimes at St. Anne's Residential School. What they failed to disclose that they were sitting on a persons of interest report on this man, Father Arthur Lavoie, a POI report that was 2,472 pages of documented evidence of rape and torture against innocent children. In the case of St. Anne's Residential School, the government suppressed the police and court records of the abuse and torture, and they blacked out the names of so many perpetrators while the survivors were deliberately denied justice. And so we are pleased the Prime Minister is calling on the Catholic Church to turn over the documents. But the reality is the federal government has their own long list and detailed list with names of the criminals and their crimes. They have a treasure trove of the documents that prove the planned attempted destruction of a people and how it was carried out. And so we are calling on Prime Minister and Attorney J General David Lametti to stop hiding and protecting the perpetrators and the crimes behind these false veils of secrecy and settlement privileges. What the discoveries of the bodies of these children at the residential schools have shown us is that we are talking about crimes against humanity and the bodies of these children are crying out for justice. So today we're calling for a clear commitment from the federal government to address the magnitude of these crimes. One, we are calling for the appointment of a fully funded special prosecutor to investigate the historic policies, the crimes and the cover-ups of abuse that were committed against the Indigenous people of this country. Secondly, we are calling for the special prosecutor to have a mandate to seek advice and guidance from the International Criminal Court because we're talking of crimes against humanity and serious breaches of international law. This prosecutor must have the right to demand all relevant documents, the Codec Historicus of each church and religious order, the school records, 
the personnel files held by the relevant church institutions in the various orders. As well, the prosecutor must have the right to access the names and records of every criminal perpetrator that Canada has on file under litigation privilege, as well as any of the relevant documents on the policies that protected these men and allowed them to carry out their crimes. And this authority of the special prosecutor must include the right to make these information public. Because the days of protecting and giving privacy to these perpetrators are over. The days of protecting their privileges are done with. We are also saying that we need the ability to access those documents through subpoena if necessary because we have asked the Catholic Church many times to work with us but we've seen obstruction after obstruction so the federal government and the Catholic Church have to be forced to turn over the relevant documents to the special prosecutor. In terms of the, the grave sites, we are calling on the government for a serious increase in the budget and resources to undertake under the authorities of the affected First Nations and Indigenous communities, the proper forensic investigations at the sites, the tracking of file histories, the ensuring that the bodies are carefully exhumed and returned to their family communities with dignity, and that this action is taken place under the authority and the oversight of the affected communities. And we are calling on David Lametti to follow through with the calls that are being made by Indigenous leaders across this country for immediate and credible action. Les Canadiens ont été choqués par les découvertes des tombes d'enfants autochtones dans les anciens pensionnats catholiques. Les Canadiens et les communautés autochtones demandent justice. Aujourd'hui, nous demandons au procureur général David Lemery de ouvrir une enquête indépendante sur ces crimes. Mais pour les justices, devient réalité la collusion entre le gouvernement et l'Église catholique doit cesser. Le refus d'enquêter sur, sur l'Église n'est pas uh, seulement uh, une politique historique, c'est la politique du gouvernement aujourd'hui. Par exemple, pourquoi le bureau de David Lemery et le gouvernement fédéral a refusé de lutter pour l'extradition de Johannes Revoir pour ses crimes contre les enfants au Nunavut? Monsieur Revoir se cache en France protégé par l'Église. Ce n'est pas acceptable. Nous demandons la création d'un procureur indépendant et ce procureur doit avoir le mandat d'inviter la Cour pénale internationale à fournir des conseils. Parce que c'est clair, c'est crime contre l'humanité. Le procureur indépendant doit avoir le pouvoir d'exiger des documents de l'Église et aussi du gouvernement fédéral. Et le gouvernement doit mettre en place les ressources nécessaires pour garantir que les communautés autochtones puissent enquêter, enquêter, identifier et rapatrier les corps dans la dignité à leur famille ou communauté. We will now take uh, any questions from the media. Thank you. Merci. So we'll now take questions, starting with questions on the phone, as usual. One question, one follow-up per reporter. So now we'll now pass to questions, commencing by the question on the phone, as the habit of a question, a question followed by a journalist. Operatrice, we have another first question. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile maintenant pour poser une question. And the first question is from David Turton, CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Maybe I missed this, but you've outlined what you're calling for today. But it, it seems that some people would like to see the perpetrators charged and face uh, criminal charges um, and, and, and the perpetrators brought to justice. So how does that fit in with this special prosecutor's mandate? Would they, you know, after they collected all this information, subpoenaed these documents, would they then work within the Canadian court system to try and, and bring the people and the institutions to justice? Would they go to the International Criminal Court 
Um, I'd be interested in hearing how that would work. Well, clearly, um, we saw what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was about trying to lay out what happened, but they did not have a mandate to pursue justice uh, and to go after the perpetrators. Canadians, the Indigenous communities are calling for justice. This is the role of a special prosecutor. Um, the federal government cannot be trusted to undertake this because we've seen with the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, we've seen with the St. Anne's survivors, the federal government is sitting on their own trove of damning documents. It would be the power of the special prosecutor to have access to all the documents, all the evidence, including all the evidence that's under settlement privilege right now, to identify where are perpetrators, those who are still alive, um, to identify people who were involved in this and have the power to name names and to take this to court. So yes, this would be the role of the special prosecutor. The role of the independent uh, criminal court would be to recognize that these are not individual mistakes or just a few bad apples. This was a policy of genocide against the people and we have to keep it in context of the international um, human rights and uh, abuses of the international court system. Follow up, David? David? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I just kind of want to switch topics here um, and uh, just permit me to do this. Uh, Jody Wilson Rabel, uh, she's an independent MP, former Liberal, of course, announced today that she will be stepping, she will not be running again as a candidate in the next federal election. She uh, said on Twitter uh, it was not an easy decision to make. Um, she's making this after, you know, long reflection. She said she's noticed Parliament has been in regression. It's become more toxic, more ineffective. I'm just wondering if both uh, Mr. Angus and uh, Madam Kakak, if you would be able to give your reaction to this, uh, to her saying that she will not be running again as a candidate. I'd love, I'd love to hear the reaction from the both of you. Yeah, I think the fact that Jody uh, isn't running again is something that is that the rest of Canada should reflect on um, as well and have those questions and look at that history, uh, understand what she has gone through. This is probably an incredibly difficult decision. I know it was uh, for me, and I imagine uh, I'll be uh, reaching out to um, her as I just found out uh, myself as well and everybody wants their 10-second uh, you know, sentence and we're here to talk about Indigenous children and we're here to talk about uh, the justice for Indigenous children and for Indigenous people. Uh, I wish Jody the best and we'll be reaching out but we're here to specifically talk about justice for Indigenous children and Indigenous people across the country so I would really appreciate to keep the focus on that. Matna. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, Christian Noël, Radio Canada. La parole est à vous. Please go ahead. Bonjour. Merci beaucoup. Um, I would like to ask the question uh, for both of you. Uh, I will ask in English, uh, and if Mr. Angus would like to try to answer in French, uh, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the Assembly of First Nations uh, decision today. They're going to pick a new leader. We might have the first uh, female grand chief. Uh, I'm trying to understand from both of you if this is what happened, and no one wants to prejudge the decision of the chiefs today, uh, what kind of, uh, of, uh, of new relations or not might that entail with the federal government? J'ai beaucoup de respect pour les candidats qui ont uh, se présenté pour le cours d'être le, le prochain chef de l'Assemblée de Première Nation. Et, uh, mais c'est une décision pour les communautés autochtones, pour cette décision-là. Et je respecte uh, cette décision. Et pour moi, ma priorité est de travailler avec les, le prochain leader et pour assurer la justice pour les communautés autochtones. Uh, et le dossier, c'est très important maintenant pour notre pays d'assurer réconciliation, justice et une, une relation équitable 
économique et le respect pour le, le culture et l'identité et les langues des communautés autochtones. Bon, donc, pour ça, j'ai je, 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 beaucoup de respect et c'est simple. MP Kakak, on the possibility of a first leader, a first female leader of APM. Sir sure, Matna, I think there are many key roles and contributors uh, of leadership throughout the country. But like I just said, let's focus on Indigenous children. Let's focus on justice for them. Let's focus on what we're talking about today. Let's do better media and ask questions that matter. Let's ask questions about the purpose that myself and my colleague, Mr. Angus, and I are here for, which is to call on a, for a special prosecutor. I said in the beginning of my statement, Revoir raped children. He has caused possible generations of trauma. Child sexual abuse in Nunavut is rampant. There is a reason for that. Let's start looking at asking the relevant questions that affect Indigenous lives every single day. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Matna. Follow up, Christian. Thank you very much. The new chief of the AFN, whoever that might be, will have to start uh, beyond having a prosecutor, uh, like you mentioned, which you very well explained. What other uh, pressing issues I, 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 that you would like the new chief, whoever that is, to bring forward to the government, both en français and in English, please? Matna for the question. And again, still asking about a um, specific item. And I represent a constituency that is 84-85% Inuk. And uh, there are different relations across the country. There are all these key roles that are very, very important that need to be heard. But what I'm calling on here and talking about here today is for justice, for Inuit, for First Nations and Indigenous peoples across the country. I'm not here to comment about a specific position. I'm here to talk about the call on the Attorney General and the Liberal government to do the right thing. Because we still see violence and death at embarrassing rates for Canada. Because we still see a lack of basic human rights for Inuit to survive day in and day out. A lack of safe place, clean drinking water, and affordable living since colonization in the last 70 years. Let's turn back to what we need to talk about, which are the children, which are indigenous peoples that deserve justice. Stop narrowing this down to a specific space. We're talking about Indigenous peoples across the country, First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Inuit and Métis are in there as well. Let's turn back to the important topic, the justice for Indigenous children across the country. Matna. C'est important to explain that uh, Madame Kakak and moi. Uh, nous avons travaillé avec uh, les leaders uh, autochtones concernant ce plan pour le développement d'un procurateur indépendant, particulièrement le rôle des de uh, les chefs de Colombie-Britannique et uh, dans les autres communautés. Les demandes pour la justice est claire. C'est nécessaire pour le gouvernement de respecter ça. Et pour le prochain chef de l'Assemblée de Premier Nation, j'imagine cette question sera une priorité pour le prochain chef, mais pour nous, nous allons continuer de travailler avec les leaders, avec les communautés, avec les grassroots pour assurer la justice pour les enfants autochtones. Opératrice, prochaine question. Thank you. Merci. The last question we have is from Christy Kirkup, The Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. 
Hi, good morning. Um, it, both uh, the Indigenous Services Minister, Mark Miller, and the Prime Minister have been asked about the call for an investigation into what happened at residential schools. And I know um, beyond what you're calling for today, Murray Sinclair, the former TRC chair, has also called for an investigation to look into potential crimes and potential cover-ups that happened at residential schools. What do you think of what the Prime Minister and Mark Miller have said to date on kind of being open to an investigation, but the fact that this is something that has to be led by the communities themselves in the way of next steps? Thank you. Well, you know, uh, in the past, we had governments that just said, no, this is what we're going to do or this is what we're not going to do. Now we have governments that say, no, we're not going to really do it. But what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the communities to, to lead the way when the communities are demanding justice. The communities have written to the prime minister. They have talked to David Lametti. They're asking for an independent prosecutor. Uh, that the appointment of that prosecutor has to come from the federal government. But the, that role has to be independent. So are we have a prime minister. He, yeah, he's really good at symbols, not very good on action. Canadians are demanding action on this. We need that independent prosecutor, that the leadership of the Indigenous communities can sit down and meet with that prosecutor to talk about that mandate, but that role has to be established. And I'm just not going to accept David Lametti saying he doesn't know how he could do that, it would be interference, or Justin and Mark Miller saying, oh, well, we're going to wait and see. We're done waiting. We're done asking. This is the message that we have received in our conversations from the communities and their leaders are saying that action has to happen now. So to the Prime Minister, do it. Send a clear message that you take these crimes against humanity seriously. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, uh, Mumbalak, I'm wondering if you could um, perhaps speak to the connection between the issue of sexual abuse in Nunavut and the a legacy of residential schools. Um, uh, being mindful that this is a, a very sensitive question, but um, because you spoke about it today, I'm just wondering what, if you could explain to Canadians the connection uh, between um, sexual abuse uh, today. Thank you. Absolutely. Matna, thank you for bringing that uh, important topic up and steering the conversation in the direction I asked. I appreciate it. There were a number of things that the Canadian, the federal institution had put in place to attempt to assimilate Indigenous peoples across the country. And that was done in a number of ways. How we most commonly talk about it today is through residential school. Indigenous people also use uh, phrases like boarding schools, hostels. But we also now know that the Northern and Inuit specific experience includes sanatoriums. And there are possibly dozens, if not hundreds of Inuit that are outside of sanatoriums because when the TB epidemic for First Nations down south had started to decline towards the 1960s, instead of keeping health services in Nunavut like the Canadian institution could have because there was some there, they had decided to decommission hospitals in both Iqaluit and Cora Harbour so that Inuit were forced to move down south. This was not something that was uh, necessary and this was something that was purposely done by the federal government to ensure that hospital beds, uh, hotels, and those kinds of things can stay full. Those Southern uh, employees can stay staffed and that Inuit continue to, to be used as econo economic uh, moving pieces. So those kinds of things and taking individuals completely out of their environment and their culture and their language and their norm has devastating impacts alone but layer that on with the experiences of immense amount of abuse that people experienced and were forced to bring back to their home communities so now what we were faced with in Nunavut were immense amounts of people that have gone to either t tuberculosis treatment residential school boarding school uh, I'm among a number of other things that the federal institution forced onto us, forced Inuit into communities, forced Inuit into situations that we continue to see play out in a way where we now see a suicide epidemic. 
we see suicide as unfortunately almost the normality in Nunavut. I have many friends and family that I have lost or that have attempted. We all have in Nunavut. That is from colonization. That is from residential schools and attempted genocide. That is from people not learning how to love as parents and teach their children love in return. Could you imagine communities filled without love? Because the children were taken away for education? This continues to carry out in ways that are horrid for communities. And those connections are very clear. And the Canadian government has done an extremely, phenomenally excellent job at hiding that history until now. Enough is enough. Charlie and I are here to help call on what is right, to call on that truth, because Canadians need to know that Indigenous people can't do this alone anymore. The lack of basic human rights is disgusting in this country for the first peoples of it. I am standing here talking about children in the ground while people suffer because they don't have a safe place to live. One in three people in Nunavut live in an overcrowded home. One in three women experience violence in the north. Seven out of 10 children in Nunavut go to school hungry. Could you imagine your child going to school hungry after yourself or your parents and your grandparents experienced all this horrible stuff I had just mentioned? And we continue to cry for help for basic. And here I am talking about basic justice, basic human rights. Children continue to experience sexual assault at alarming rates due to intergenerational trauma and these institutions that the Canadian government put in place. There are clear connections. We are not asking for more. We are asking for same. A place to live that is safe, being able to drink water and bathe oneself and afford to feed oneself and those you love. We're asking for basic after being put through a horrid history that continues to play out. And I hope today is just the beginning of those conversations because I think Canadians understand why there is a need to be upset. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just scratching open that black plague of colonization. And we need to ensure communities have healing along the way. This is just the beginning of those conversations and that starts with independent investigation with a special prosecutor. Matna. And we'll now take a question from the room, Christopher. Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. Uh, thanks very much for taking our questions. Uh, Ms. Kupkuk, I have a question for you as, as well. Uh, about another oblate priest, uh, Johan Rivoire, who allegedly abused kids in the north from the 1960s through the 1990s and who now lives in France. Uh, I'm wondering um, if you're satisfied at all to, at the degree to which the Canadian government has sought to have charges laid against this individual in France, uh, whether you've spoken with Minister Bennett about this. and. And also, uh, given France's policy of not uh, extraditing its citizens, what you're hoping Justice Minister Lamedi can, can do? Matna, thank you for that question. Um, so they, like I've mentioned, had done uh, little to, to nothing. They didn't uh, attempt any sort of exercise within their power and have been using the famous uh, words of excuse of this is not within our responsibility or our authority, even though it well is. And that's why we're here today. We need to force the federal institution to force the Catholic Church to hand over those documents. We know that the federal institution, the Justice Department themselves has documents. We know I know that this uh, particular case with Revar has been something that has been discussed and ongoing. There have been individuals throughout Nunavut who have had the courage to come forward about their 
their experience related to this man. There have been people that have passed and never have seen that justice and never will now. And there is a particularly interesting aspects to this case where um, when this individual was coming back and forth between countries, how um, they might have lost citizenship but the Canadian government won't even confirm or look into those kinds of things. So just every opportunity that they get to put aside their responsibility is what they take. And that's why we need this independent prosecutor in place so that we can see people like Revar back in the country facing justice and see healing start for these individuals that are still alive and for families that still need that healing. Matna. When uh, we became aware uh, that Father Lavoie had been spirited out of the country and was being protected in France, uh, my office wrote to David Lametti and asked for him to take action. Um, they never took it seriously. And there's all kinds of legal excuses, but I think the fundamental question, and this is why Mumalak and I wanted to bring this case today, is to say the days when the Oblate Mission or any other institution can take a perpetrator and sneak them out of the country and there's no consequences, that's over. Uh, the day when the federal government says, oh, well, it's jurisdictional, oh, well, too bad, so sad, that's over. These were crimes, serious crimes that have destroyed families, that have destroyed individuals, and it's part of the larger pattern. When we wrote to Lametti, we asked for him, if he was not able to get Revoir uh, brought back to Canada, to have him tried in France for those crimes. But there has to be, from this point on, accountability. And any church institution that protects these guys, any church institution that sneaks them out of the country, we have to be able to get them culpable as well. As part of the goal of accountability that this special prosecutor and independent investigation uh, would seek, I'm wondering if uh, another one of those goals is criminal prosecution more of particular individuals or if we're thinking of criminal charges against, should they be warranted, uh, organizations and institutions? One of the really uh, concerning things that w happened during the Truth and Reconciliation and leading to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement was that each of the church orders were brought to the table because they were facing massive um, liabilities they were facing massive lawsuits and the indian residential school settlement agreement let them get off early, very easy they turned over the documents they paid a small i mean for the catholic church it was 25 million dollars uh and the catholic church never paid that money and they continued to him and haw about turning over documents and what what we've seen since the 1990s is that the catholic orders like the oblates have created new corporate structures to protect themselves from liability so that there's no longer, as we were taught in, in uh, the Sunday school about the one holy Roman Catholic Church, now there's a whole bunch of little uh, independent organizations that can pr be protected from liability. I, I think the days of asking them to do the right thing are over. Uh, a special prosecutor needs the authority to be able to get those documents and if crimes were committed to stop the protection of these orders. That, I think, is a fundamental. In the case of the St. Anne's Residential School, we had a very powerful police investigation. They got subpoenas. They got the documents um, from those orders. They forced them to turn them over, but then the Justice Department turned around and hid them. And this is the other thing that's really concerning, is that the, the federal government has the names of thousands of these perpetrators. Why they are given privacy and protection for their crimes is is not acceptable. Privacy and protection belongs to the survivors, to the victims, to the people who had the, the decency and the courage to come forward. It does not apply to protect the perpetrators. So the, the men like Lavoie, the, the, the multiple other offenders, they cannot be protected and neither should the re institutions that protected them. There has to be some accountability. And, uh, and I think what we're seeing, being that we're dealing with this as a crime against humanity, there has to be a standard of serious accountability at this point. And I'll check if we, want, if we have one last question on the phone. Nous allons vérifier s'il reste une dernière question au téléphone, Béatrice. Thank you. Merci. 
And the last question, Boris Prou, Le Devoir. La parole est à vous. Please go ahead. Uh, bonjour, hi. I, I just want to make clear the point you just made. Do you, are you accusing the federal government of uh, plotting or conspirating with the perpetrators? And uh, what do you expect out of this uh, prosecution? How many um, conviction or jail time for perpetrators? What we saw in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement is that the Catholic Church in particular and the federal government shared the same objective, which was limiting their liability. So yes, there's been collusion. There's been collusion at every level. Uh, this is the story of the St. Anne's Residential School hearings, where the names of the perpetrators were protected. The evidence was not turned over. The survivors went into hearings uh, where the Justice Department said that their stories had no credibility because the Justice Department hid the documents. Why did they do that? if not to protect uh, the Catholic Church. Why was the Catholic Church allowed to walk away on the $25 million it was supposed to pay? And nobody held them to account. And the federal government, I wrote to Carolyn Bennett on this. They said, oh, well, it was too bad. It was a lawyer's thing. Number one, the Catholic Church has to stop approaching this through their lawyers and have to start approaching this through their moral responsibility. The federal government has to stop saying that the interests of the church will be protected because that's what has happened. Um, in terms of the amount of prosecutions, we have no idea. Um, so much of this is done behind closed doors. We know there's thousands of documents. Let a special prosecutor be fully funded with all the research capacity necessary to respond to the seriousness of these crimes that have been committed against the people. And then we can dis dis discuss what justice looks like. But until we have had that full independent investigation, um, it's all speculation. But we all know that a mass crime against humanity was perpetrated in this country. There are perpetrators. There were policies. Let's find and, and identify this and have that mandate for the prosecutor to make this a public and, if necessary, name those perpetrators. They do not get the veil of silence anymore. Follow up? Uh, thank you. As a, a follow up, uh, it would be uh, directed to MP Mumila Kakak. Um, uh, as you know, the Assembly of the First Nation is electing its new chief today. Um, do you have a preference uh, on the person who has to be chosen or uh, that you want to share? And what kind of challenges um, the new chief uh, would face regarding this topic of residential school at large? Um, maybe third time's a charm. Um, so I'm not First Nations, I'm Inuk. Um, I would have to look at the specifics. I couldn't um, give you any comment on that. And I'm sure First Nations need to make that decision for themselves. And uh, that's not a place for me to insert my opinion, I don't think. And I'm sure the next person uh, will be uh, a great pick and, and do a good job. But back to what we're talking about here. And again, to be clear, and let's do better media because those kinds of questions don't apply to me. I am Inuk. I'm not First Nations. I represent a constituency that is majority Inuit. That question is not that relevant to me, and I honestly can't speak to it that much. I am Inuk, not First Nations. Back to the Indigenous peoples across the country, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis that deserve justice and truth, that's what we're here to talk about today. That independent that availability for an independent prosecutor to do an investigation. And we're talking about justice for Indigenous children and peoples across Canada today. Matna. And this concludes the press conference. This is my final conference. The press, merci.